This is Bounty, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. You know, I have two kids, no degree. I walked into Atari and said, I've written a game and sold it. Want to hire me? And Dennis Koble did. This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. I'm Kevin Savitz. Bob Smith worked at Atari where he created video pinball for the Atari 2600. He also wrote two programs for the Atari 8-Bit, which were sold by Atari Program Exchange, Sound Editor and Sleazy Adventure, which both appeared in the inaugural APX catalog, Fall 1981. He left Atari to co-found the game developer iMagic, where he programmed Riddle of the Sphinx, Dragonfire, Moonsweeper, and other games. Then he went on to work on games at Bally, Electronic Arts, and Accolade. This interview took place on June 24, 2016. You, uh, it took a while to get your interview. You said you were you were working and you're finishing a project. Are you what what was what was? Uh, I, I was I to? was doing a contract for Glue, um, a mobile application. I can't say anything beyond that because it's not published yet. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I, I I've been in Portland about a year now. I we moved up from Ashland, and uh, we've been living in Portland. So I decided somebody called and said, you know, through the good old boy network, of course and uh, said, do you, want, do, you want, do you want some work? I said, okay, I can do three months. Uh, that'll uh, get me to, J- to Japan and, and maybe a cruise. <laughs> nice, yeah. So, so, that's, so I did that. I ju- just wound up with them. You know, the project wasn't finished, but uh, mm-hmm. they, their budget ran out, and I was just a, an outside, outside gun. All right, so normally, yeah, I, I end by asking what you do today, but since we're already there, I mean, it sounds like you're still doing contract programming work. Uh, I probably won't do any more. Um, since, since Innovative Leisure folded, Innovative, Innovative Leisure was a group of uh, ex-Atari people. There were about 12 of us who had been coin-op and, and consumer, and, and uh, Tim Skelly from uh, another coin-op company had joined us. And they folded, unfortunately, but I kept on working. So I've got like four prototypes that I've done, uh, you know, mainly Unity-based. That's what everybody's using these days. Mm-hmm. And uh, they'll probably go nowhere. So I do, I, let's say I do it for fun, and I have <laughs> okay. another idea I want to work on. I just finished a 2600 cartridge for the uh, National Video Game Museum mm-hmm. um, so that they can sell that at their, at their store. Because I, I, want, I, want uh, I want that concern to keep going. Oh, neat. So this is a, a, a new game that they will sell at the video game yes. machine? Yes. Well, tell yes, me about I wrote that. It. Um, I wrote it about two years ago, and I've always wanted to do a dungeon. And uh, the limitations of the 2600 said, you know, it's going to look a lot like the original wizardry. You know, it's, it's, going to be a, uh, it's, it's going to be a line drawing, and monsters will pop up at the right place. And, you know, I, I spent three or four months just to see if I could get the display running. Because the display is no mean feat, depending on how many intersections you look into the into the maze. So I did a ten level maze, and and you know, as many weapons as I could do, and I finally finally like sixteen k. Um, but uh, it's a, it's just about finished. I'm I'm actually inserting their logo into it because it'll be exclusive to them. Oh, that's cool. And, and David Crane wrote one as well, and I don't I don't know anything about his, but oh. uh, the two of us have both contributed that way to the uh, oh, that's cool. National Video Game Museum. This is the which one is in, very cool. in you know, Dallas, Texas? Ha- haven't been there. It's just north of Dallas, and they did a really nice job, and they really tried to cover everything, you know, from the old 2600 days to mobile. So they, if you haven't seen it, it's, it's excellent. No, I haven't seen it yet. That sounds great. I'd like to check that out. Yeah, it's not a huge space, but they, they did a first-class job of it. They, they had some uh, museum people come in and, and say and consult and say, well, listen, we can turn this space into a museum for 10 mil. And they said, well, let's try something else. So they, they got together with a lot of local artists and local engineers and, you know, local tech people and got it all together. And it's, they just did a wonderful job, That's which cool. is good because they, they, they worked a long time to get this rolling. And, mm-hmm. you know, just all the all the the uh, paraphernalia that we've all had in our closets for the last 20 years. They, you know, they have a lot of original development systems and things like that there. 
Right. All right. So since you're still making 2,600 games, let's talk about doing it now versus doing it then. I I assume it's way easier now because you can cross compile on other systems and you have better tools and it, it, I assume it's way better now. Is that true? Well, it's certainly better than what I had at Atari. When we went to a Magic, we 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 went for in circuit emulators, um, which apart from being you know having their own proprietary assembler and whatnot, were very slick systems and could you know could do all our system timing and all the break pointing that we wanted. Um, on the emulators these days, they're pretty darn good because you can pause the screen and you still have a screen. <laughs> right. You know, of course, on the 2600, you know, when you pause the uh, processor, that you just get lines on the screen from whatever graphics registers have been turned on. So that's that's very handy. Um, and, you know, single-stepping, and this was heavily, the last one I did was heavily bank-switched, and that was pretty straightforward on the emulator. You know, it had 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 okay break pointing. I mean, it wasn't source level, but that's fine. You know, in assembly, you don't really need it. All right, so let's hop in the Wayback Machine, and I would like to hear before the beginning, before you were hired by Atari, how, how you were a nerd, how you got interested in computers and things, and kind of set me up for this story. <laughs> wow, I have a long, interesting story. Um, right. I didn't go to school. I graduated from high school and, and uh, did a year in physics at the University of Santa Clara and then decided that basically people wanted me to make weapons, and I fell in love that year and got married. <laughs> so I moved to New Mexico, built a dome, had two kids, and then, I, and then finally personal computers were coming out. When I first tried to do computer work, I was handed a, a, you know, a stack of punch cards, and I thought, oh, this isn't exactly what I had in mind. <laughs> And I don't really want to learn COBOL. Mm -hmm. So um, I, while we were living in New Mexico, a lumberyard was in business. I said, hey, you need a microcomputer to do your inventory. So I built them a, a, a S100 machine. I don't know if you're that old or not. Uh, I, I'm familiar them. with them. I have, don't have a lot okay, of experience. Okay, an old processor but, technology yeah. 8080 machine. And uh, wrote them an accounts payable and receivable and inventory and yada, yada, yada. But at the same time, uh, processor technology had included a source listing of the, of the BIOS. And I thought, wow, this is cool. So I, re I read that over and over and over again until I understood it. Taught myself 8080 and wrote a game. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and did that on the processor technology, which fortunately had a memory map character screen, a lot like the TRS-80 at the time. So... I translated the game from the processor technology 8080 to Z80 on, for the uh, for the trash, and uh, sold it to Creative Computing, which was a you know a, a, a computing ma magazine early early in the, in sure. the uh, cycle. Mm -hmm. And uh, about that time, my wife said, well, "You know, I I really want to go back to California." She was born and raised in the Bay Area, and and you know a native Californian. So we left, and here I you know I have two kids. No degree. I walked into Atari and said, I've written a game and sold it. Um, Want to hire me? And Dennis Coble did. Wow. <laughs> so, um, and from there, um, you know, I was kind of given a, here's a list of about 12 games that Atari wants. And I said, okay, I'll do video pinball. And so I learned the 2600, and I was coming from Intel land, you know, 8080 and Z80. Mm -hmm. So I had to learn the 6502, which is fortunately a very simple but elegant processor, and the 2600, and did video pinball in the first six months I was there. So I remember being at my first CES with, with video pinball and the, uh, the Fantastic Four, you know, Alan, Al, Al Miller and Dave Crane and, and uh, Bob Whitehead and Larry Kaplan walked up to my game and looked at it and they decided I could join the club. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I was an accepted 2600 programmer. Unfortunately, at that point, I was 30 years old, I had gray hair, and Atari decided I should be a supervisor instead of a programmer. Mm. So that's what I did for Atari. I, 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 did, I did some test software for uh, Super Stella, which was a, a, a new chipset that was designed to supplant both the 800 and the 2600 as a game machine. Um, 
but I was basically management from then on out. And then uh, three of us left, Dennis Koval and, and Rob Fulop and I left mm-hmm. for uh, Imagic. Right. All right, so before we get to iMagic, we will talk sure. about that for sure. So the only 2600 game you did at Atari was Video Pinball before they yeah. yep. took you upstairs? Yeah, Yeah, I had a, you know, I, I was, I was uh, supervising a few, but, uh, you know, but, and, you know, I hired Howard, and, and of course, Todd was there. Um, but, yeah, no, that's all I did was, was essentially management and test software. You mm-hmm. know, they had a new proportional stick that they thought was wonderful, and, but their processor was so slow, and you had to average readings. It was it was ugly. Hmm. Well, so tell me about more about some things that uh, products that didn't happen. You, you mentioned the Super Stella and that stuff. Well, I, yeah, I feel bad about the Super Stella. I was doing um, test software for it, so they had this huge wire wrapped S one hundred setup in the in the in the chip lab you know they were they were trying to develop a chip so they had all the circuitry laid out and it was all wire wrapped so every time it misbehaved somebody would would hit it (laughs) to make it work again um but it had some fatal flaws it turned out um gee i don't know how how technical to get um after you can go all the way technical okay okay. after a player was presented you know a, a, a sprite in in modern day we call them players at atari but you know they're Mm -hmm. called sprites these days after it was finished it would cause an interrupt and this was so you could reuse that particular hardware sprite further down on the screen and i found a case where an interrupt could interrupt an interrupt and you wouldn't know where it came from Hmm. Which, in my opinion, was a deal killer. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, because you, you know, once you set up your interrupts to run, right. and your screen is not highly organized, you know, like a bunch of players running around on a field, um, things could go to hell fast. So I kind of feel bad because I, I, I probably killed Super Stella. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was Atari's successor machine. Yeah. Uh, but it had the, you know, it had a real problem for a coder. Otherwise, I really liked it. You know, it had lots of colors, and I think it had 320 resolution. So, you know, it, it was it was really nice. And I think it had eight or sixteen hardware sprites. And you know, there were there were a lot of very cool things about it. Hmm. Um, but it was just in the wire wrap stage. You know, they hadn't really uh, put it on silicon yet. Right. So, so if an interrupt at, got... at that point, they decided to revamp the 400-800 into the 5200 instead with that awful proportional stick. Mm. Yeah, nobody li- nobody has ever liked those sticks, and they're, <laughs> they're still oh, create yeah. problems it's... for people who like the 5200 because the sticks break all the time, and uh, yeah, it's an issue. Yeah, yeah. no, and, and you know we all wrote our games for a four button joystick. You know that was that was really important in 2600 days because the graphics were not worth looking at and the sounds were just about as bad but if it played well and, and reacted well to the stick and you know it could draw you in as as we like to do right so did you did you manage any uh particular projects for the 400 800 5200 uh, no it was it was mainly 2600 stuff because at mm-hmm. that point you know 2600 was just gangbusters they could they couldn't uh, you know and that was that was when E.T. and Raiders and all those things were happening as well. So all the cash was going into there. And the, the home computer group was, was a separate group. Right. So it was uh, not really close. In fact, I think they were in a separate building after not too many months. Just before I left Atari, we had, we had moved uh, out of Baragas, mm-hmm. uh, 1262. But you did write a couple of programs for the computers, which were published by APX, correct? Yes, yeah, yes, I did. I did Sleazy Adventure, mm-hmm. um, which you know that that was a uh, an initiation process at, at Atari. Uh, I, I think it was Larry Kaplan had had written this piece of basic that was you know essentially a uh, an adventure interpreter, and and you just put in your own data, right? And uh, so everybody had done one. Just and um, Rob Fulop wrote an amazing one called Marking Adventure. I don't know if that ever made it to APX or not. But no, I'm not familiar with that. That was well, that was one of the very best examples. And Dennis Coble wrote one involving a Rubik's cube or a, a box with different colored sides. It was very confusing but logical. 
and uh, and I wrote one as well. Just you know, and I mean, people would stop me in the hallway and say, "Well, I didn't think you were. <laughs> I thought you were a lot more straight laced than this." <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's really. I mean, I'm surprised Atari published it. I mean, it, for those who don't know, it's it's a game where you're in some. Uh, I don't remember some foreign. Uh, place in, in you're in the seamy backside of Thailand. Yes, yes. I, re- I yeah. remember a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> and and you're and you're supposed to uh, f- find rare treasures and smuggle them home on your friend's boat. <laughs> yep, uh, that was that was that was the idea. So where where did this idea come from, sir? <laughs> um, actually, I was a boat builder. Uh, this this was why, before I moved to New Mexico. I built mm-hmm. trimarans in the Bay Area. And I knew a lot of smugglers. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh yeah. Are you kidding? What do you think? What do you you know? Uh, there was a. I, this is way far afield. There was a gigantic ex cannery. You know, there used to be a, a lot of sardine and thing in the bay, things in the bay. And uh, so there was a, there was a huge abandoned cannery, and Ivan owned a boat a, a boatyard there and rented out the space to hippie boat builders. Hmm. And they would come in, build themselves a plywood shack inside the cannery, and start building their boat right outside their little shack. And you know, and probably half of them had intentions of smuggling. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that wow. that's that has nothing to do with video games. No, it has everything to do. Yeah, with that, I do have an interest in sailing. I've always wanted to do a, a really nice sailing simulator, but the ones I've seen are so dry. That I just I can't figure out how to amp it up or, or make it interesting for most people, mm. and I've never you know I've never been a racer you know I've I've always uh, been more into let's go let's go to someplace new rather mm-hmm. than how fast can we go. Hmm. So all right so yeah a sleazy adventure where you you try to find things and and smuggle them home. Uh, I particularly liked in it that uh, there's there's one room where you're like in a. Uh, underground sewer or something and it says like you're likely to catch typhoid and and then you have to take typhoid and that's how you get out and end up in the hospital <laughs> and you cure yourself by dropping typhoid i yeah i, I forgot <laughs> it's that, ridiculous that it's i mean i love it it's so it's just silly i like no it was, it was fun I, I did that probably in the first three months i was at atari while i was uh, blocking out video pinball hmm. nice Cool. And then the other APX thing you did was uh, a sound editor program. Uh, that doesn't surprise me. I, I, I've actually done a lot of tools over my career. And when, just before I left Atari, you know, I decided, that, you know, this is silly. Why don't we have artists doing our art for us? Because, you know, we've been pushing our own pixels. And so at Atari, we hired Marilyn Toyer, which to my knowledge is the first graphic artist ever hired into the business that wasn't, you know, doing marketing graphics or something like that, actually mm-hmm. doing pixel art. And uh, I was also doing sound stuff. When I, when I got to a Magic X, I wrote much more sophisticated ones. I had one that uh, connected the 800 to the 2600, so you could you could compose... 2600 sounds on the 800 then play them through the 2600 hmm. um, but that was you know uh, that was a development tool and then I wrote a background editor which we didn't use very much obviously with the 2600 mm-hmm. and Rob Fulop wrote a great little animation editor that we used a lot at Magic well, but the but the sound editor yeah I you know I looked at the sound registers and, and thought okay how can we use these and uh, Brad Stewart had done the first talking game. He did a talking baseball. Um, of course, you know, the screen had to blank and everything else while it spoke. <laughs> it <laughs> right. did speak, and, and the speech probably took up better than half his rum. But um, uh, so I didn't, I, you know, I didn't try speech, but I wanted to experiment more. And in fact, the, uh, the, the boing sound from uh, Video Pinball came out of that tool. Hmm. And I think I, I think I, I mapped it out with that tool and, and then figured out an algorithm that would do it because, you know, algorithms were the name of the game for 2,600 sounds. You rarely table drove something. Just to, to, uh, for saving space? There's not enough ROM, yeah. Yeah. It's all spent on graphics. Were there any other, any other thing at, at Atari we need to talk about before we move on to iMagic? Oh, not really. Uh, I mean, it, it was great. You know, we had a lot of carte blanche uh, trips to Las Vegas and Chicago, and 
I love the Art Institute. I, I didn't spend much time on the floor, but I went to the Art Institute every time I went to Chicago. Yeah. Was it, um, I've heard it was just like crazy party atmosphere there. Uh, yes, it yeah. was. It was. Things, things were, were very, very loose there. Did you partake? Um, oh, heck yeah. Um, you know, I was, uh, you know, I was married and two kids, but, uh, no, we had, we had a good time. We had a good time. It, you know, we always used to say it beat a real job and that it did, you know, crunch time is never any fun. Right. But, uh, and you know, the work, the work is hard and frustrating and, and so on. But, uh, we managed to all, all take it with a grain of salt and mm-hmm. play each other's games and so on. And Atari treated us to some nice parties. And I did. I, I didn't get the big payoff from Atari, but a few of my friends did, and that's all good. Yeah. Hmm. All right. So um, I would like to hear the story. I think it has been told before, but I would still all the same. I would like to hear the story about uh, how and why you left Atari and uh, the beginnings of iMagic. Well, um, when I first arrived at Atari, my first departmental meeting. We all sat in a conference room, and they said, Space Invaders has sold half a million units. We're astounded. And over the next six months, at every software meeting, that number kept increasing until it was, it was 2 million, which was unheard of for the business. So there were piles of cash coming in. And you, you know, we got to thinking, you know, it's like video pinball. Okay, they paid me about $8,000 to program it. Mm-hmm. Okay, which is nothing. Um, they, they sold two million of them, and they they probably got twenty to twenty five dollars wholesale for them, and paid five dollars in materials. So, mm-hmm. you know, we're talking two million times what twenty. So we're talking forty million dollars that that my piece of work brought to them, and so most everybody, and that's why the Activision boys left too. Right. They just wanted a nickel a cart. And so people were pretty unhappy, and Atari came up with something called a phantom stock plan, which nobody really bought for a second. It, you know, it really sounded like something was being pulled over on somebody. Um, and uh, Bill Grubb and, and Dennis had been talking, and they'd been talking to a, a man by the name of Brian Dougherty, who was at, uh, at Mattel at the time, and were saying, let's do an Activision. You know, we'll pay you guys royalties if you want to come along with us. So Dennis asked me and Rob to to do a magic with them. And I mm-hmm. said, yep, I, you know, I was, what, 31 then? And I said, okay, you know, I'm young enough to take a chance. Mm-hmm. If it doesn't pan out, then I'll, I'll do something else. But uh, So I went with them to a magic. And it was essentially because there was a lot, you know, I mean, Bill Grubb, who was, who was our, our CEO, Saw them, yeah, and he he and uh, Mark. What was Mark's last name? Sorry, I can't remember. Um, he and the and the sales VP had some inkling of what we could make money wise, because they were you know they were watching this incredible you know, Atari selling all these amazing uh, numbers, and they decided that we should do the same. So the idea was we were going to do Atari and Mattel, because those were the biggest names. Mm-hmm. And uh, unfortunately, the, the Mattel um, required an awful lot of preparation before they could actually code games. You know, they, they needed to set up a, I don't know, I forgot where they, I think they, they bought a VAX, you know, which, you know, a big PDP. And uh, they, had to, they had to write an operating system. And it took them uh, probably two years before they were, they were actually ready to start putting things out. So Atari kind of carried the company, but you know, after after two or three years, uh, things went south for the industry generally. So right. that was the end of that. Yeah, and then so, we went on to do doing contract work. So at Imagic, were you were you back to programming, or were, did you stay? Oh yeah, no, I signed on as a programmer. Mm-hmm. So I I did a cartridge every six months. I mean, you know, it was mm-hmm. between CESs at that stage. So we tried to have a new uh, release every six months. Sure. So I did, you know, Little Sphinx and Dragonfire and Star Voyager and Moon Sweeper. Um, I did a translation of uh, Star Wars the Arcade. And then when things started to go south a little bit, we started taking uh, 
in fact, the Star Wars was on a contract from Parker Brothers. And unfortunately, it was a rush job. They said, you know, we, we're only going to own this license for another 12 weeks or something idiotic. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, I busted my hump for that long to get it done. I still would have liked another week or two. There's still some things I do not like about that game, but um, that's the way of it. And did some Commodore 64 work for, I think that was for Parker Brothers as well. Some of the Choose Your Own Adventure series, mm-hmm. which wasn't very exciting, but... You know, it was cash in the door, and the magic was sorely needing that. Mm-hmm. What what work there are you most proud of? Oh, I think Dragonfire. You know, I did. I, I got to got to mention an IEEE Spectrum for my Dragonfire kernel, mm-hmm. which is which is cool. You know, mm-hmm. considering I don't have a degree, that's that's about as high as I'm going to get in the industry. <laughs> Um, so, you know that, and you know there was there were there were some good people there, um, very talented people there. And that was probably the best time. And, you know, it was kind of odd, you know, the startup thing. You know, I'd, I'd gone to work for Atari, you know, a huge company, you know, that we never ever saw the CEO. And a, vi- and a vice president was rare, whereas at Magic, you know, we were in Saratoga, which was kind of a, a nice little suburb of San Jose up in, up in the hills. And it was very artsy, craftsy, hoity-toity, so, you know, nice restaurants and so on. Um, but... Yeah, magic was you know magic was, was was a sudden rise and a sudden fall, and then on to other things. Right, and uh, all right. So you did. So, sorry, did you do any in television stuff while you were at a magic? No, I didn't. Right. Um, um, some of my games were translated to the in television, but it was it was too weird. Um, <laughs> you know, it was a ten bit processor, which mm-hmm. was strange enough. But the biggest problem for us Atari programmers was the fact that it used an operating system so that it, all of your, your inputs were read through the operating system, which kind of gave it an, an inherent lag. Hmm. Um, and a lot of things were done through the operating system, whereas in the 2600, every frame, mm-hmm. you had access to everything you right. wanted. You know, all the hardware was accessible. Um, so... Their games were nice because you had this background. You know, you could have these nice bitmapped images in the background, scrolling bitmapped images. Um, but the feel wasn't very good. And that stupid disc, you know, uh, compared to the joystick, you know, there was just no comparison. Right. Hmm. So so I stayed away from the television. Okay. And, I, you know, I, I had my, you know, since I was shipping every six months, you know, I was always, I was always busy. Sure. And, so you didn't uh, feel you know, limited by the the 2600, which was, you know, by objective measurements, a much less powerful machine than the Intellivision. You, you like the hardware? It, it, well, it, it was a trade off. I, I I think the 2600 games played better, but I think the Intellivision stuff looked a lot better. And sound wise, I, I I'd have to stop and go back and 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 think about that. Intellivision probably had better sounds. Hmm. Um, and you know certainly the Atari was an earlier technology and, and probably cheaper to produce. You know, it was only right. three chips. Yeah, yeah. All right. So when I, I, I Magic uh, crashed, you uh, went on to Valley Senti. I went on. Yep, I went on and, and did Coin Op. And at that point, Valley uh, had contracted to uh, use the Amiga 500A board. And the Amiga's a real neat chipset. It you know it's, it's pretty limited by today's standards, but at the time it was it was pretty hot stuff and and had uh, displayed you know hardware display lists and some very very interesting things. Um, and uh, let's see, I oh yeah, I, I I went out for surgery, and when I got back, uh, the company had folded. <laughs> <laughs> we hadn't folded it. Uh, Valley had closed it down. You know, Sente mm-hmm. was, was was Howie, Howie Delman and, and Ed Rothberg mm-hmm. and Roger Hector, and then they got bought by Valley, and then we were doing stuff with Valley. And at some point, Nolan was involved, but I don't know it. You know, in what context? Hmm. So what uh, what did you program while you were there? Um, I. Did did a piece on one of Dennis Coble's driving games, um, and then I was doing something called Moonquake, 
um, what would I compare it to? It was kind of like Cuba. You were walking along cubes in space, and the cubes, and you were mining. So you were a robot mining these cubes, and some of them would disappear when you stepped on them, and some would go up, and some would go down, and so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, it didn't test very well, so it, did, it never went out. Hmm. And when 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 that was dead, I did a few tools. Um, at that time, communication, you know, we, we were using ICES at that point, and uh, I think it was, t- Rich Adam was working on Trivial Pursuit, and it was taking him like an hour and a half to two hours to download his project from his compiler into his target hardware. So I said, I can do something better than that. So we fixed him up, a, you know, a little RS-232 and squirted it over at about four or five times that rate. So it only took him a half hour. You know, it was, it was, it was several megabytes, you know, at that point. That was uh, pretty slow. But, of course, processors were, what, 8 megahertz at the time? That was a fast machine. Right. Electronic Arts was next? But, yeah, I, 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 I went to EA. I've forgotten how I got there. I don't remember whether I walked in or whether I was headhunted for that one. Um, anyway, I, 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 went, I went to Electronic Arts. This is, this is when they were first getting going. That's when uh, we were all artistes, and Trip Hawkins was in charge, and it, this is before they went public. So I went there, and I was working on a game called UFO, and at the same time they were building a, uh, a polygon engine to do the displays with. Mm-hmm. So while I was working on UFO, I did all the software rendering code for the PC because I was an assembly language guy, and I wrote really fast code for the PC. Um, so that's that's mainly the and and that work finally came out in the form of LHX, which was Brent Iverson's, and uh, so my my polygon work got out, and I left after about a year and a half because I was living in San Jose and commuting to Foster City and. I just decided I didn't want to do this anymore, and, and uh, um, some people from Accolade had, had given me a call and said, you know, we'd really like you to come down and be our tools manager. So I thought about it for a while, and Accolade was like, you know, 10 minutes away. So I finally said, okay, I'm, I'm leaving EA and went to Accolade. Uh, unfortunately, it was right before uh, they went public, so I lost out there, but life's full of those. Uh, the only the other interesting thing I did at Electronic Arts was reverse engineer the Sega, hmm. and the Sega was was tightly held for a long, long time, and they were suing anybody. Um, and the first part of their ROM was copyrighted, but integral to starting up the machine. You actually had to have that that sequence of bytes in the ROM for the machine to start. And finally, EA, after I left, EA won that battle and said, we're going to produce our own cartridges. We're not going to have Sega do it. Was it Sega? Anyway, um, but it was interesting stuff. You know, it was a 68,000 system, and I love the 68,000. It's almost a high-level language. Um, and marching through their ROM and looking for things. It was, it was a very interesting experience. Hmm. So uh, you're one of the people who are really, you're kind of part of the, the scene today, you know, if you go to a classic gaming show, you're you're sometimes there giving. Uh, yeah, I usually I, I've been coming to the Portland show for about four or five years, mm-hmm. and and I I've hit most of the of uh, the expos in Las Vegas, not all of them, but but a number of them. So yeah, and I you know I'm I, I'm not seriously working anymore, at least since mm-hmm. I finished this damn project. <laughs> um, so I've got I've got the time. And, uh, and you know, and I, I'd kind of like to build the legacy. I'm not going to be around forever. You know, I'm mm-hmm. I'm 67 now, so I'm not going to I'm not going to live live for long. So I may as well uh, say what I have to say, and well, I'm still around. So mm. I, I usually go to the shows. Yeah, that's really cool. Is, is it weird being a minor celebrity in a strange little niche? Of <laughs> it's the only time I ever sign autographs, and <laughs> and you and I both know that the only reason they get them autographed is so they're worth more on eBay. Right. You know? yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, some people some people are genuinely interested, you know, and and uh, so that's fine. And there are fanboys, so you know that's that's all good. If you, if you like video games, that's fine. Yeah. If you want, you want to hear about the history? I'll I'll be glad to uh, BS for you. <laughs> what haven't we talked about yet that we should? What's a favorite story that 
that people like to hear that you like to tell yeah. that we haven't gotten to yet? Oh, gee, I don't know about favorite stories. I'm not Todd. Todd's got a lot of good ones. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell his stories. Um, let's see. So, yeah, uh, the, other thing, the other part we didn't hit was I, I, I also went back to work for Trip at 3DO. Hmm. Richard Hicks called me. I forgot where I was working at the time, and and said, hey, "Why don't you come up and work for 3DO? You know, we'll, we want you to manage some projects." So I did, and I did that. I you know I did that for seven years actually. It was it was it was one of the longer stretches. And just as I qualified for my sabbatical, they went out of business. Hmm. And unfortunately, and and yeah. you know you know how those go. You know, the lawyers made out, but the rest of us kind of got uh, got hit. Right. So yeah. we didn't get our last paycheck and just a lot of other things that, you know, by law we should have had. So mm-hmm. bitch, bitch, bitch. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I, 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 did like, I did like working at 3DL. They were, uh, you know, on, on the shore in Redwood City. So when things got too heavy, we could always go out and look at the water and, you know, nice vacant business parks so we could kind of wander through the grasslands there. Nice. But uh, but that was that was a good experience. Cool. So I worked for them until they went under, <clears throat> and then I worked went to work for Gary Kitchen um, at uh, Skyworks, which was actually edutainment or edutainment no infotainment. Mm-hmm. Sure, um, <laughs> it was basically it was basically you know commercial plugs. You know, lifesavers would call them and say we want you to do something, mm-hmm. and uh, so. I, I worked for them for a few years off-site while I was living in uh, Southern Oregon. And, and uh, yeah, Gary is a good guy. I hadn't worked with him before. You know, he's a, he's he has a 2600 history as well. But, uh, but anyway, right. he turned out to be a really good guy. Nice, cool. So, do you see now that you've you finished that project for the museum and you're you're retired from your your other stuff? Do you see any more uh, Atari programming work in your future? Probably not the 2600. Um, you know, it, it was fun getting back into it, and, I, and I, there are a lot of things I really like about the 2600. Um, but, you know, I just, I don't have the patience to do algorithmic sounds anymore. You know, it takes a long time to get the right sounds out of the 2600. And that's a major, major project, I think. Mm-hmm. And, I'd already, and, I, and I already spent most of my, most of my 16K on graphics. You know, because I, I have a title screen and, you know, things like that that mm-hmm. we just never put in the cartridges due to ROM limitations. Sure, yeah. Well, now you can do Sleazy Adventure 2, perhaps. Well, I don't know that I'm going to do any more games. I, I do have a couple of ideas. Um, and uh, Rob Zadibble, who is another ex guy, and I mm-hmm. get together once a week and usually talk games and game ideas. And he's not, he's he's interested in designing, but he's not interested in coding anymore. So I've been the coding fool on these. But like I say, you know, we've whipped out about four prototypes, but don't expect them to go anywhere. <laughs> okay. Um, if you could send a message to the Atari community that still exists, and you can right now, what would you tell them? Oh, good one. Oh, I think I, I think hang in there. They, you know, they were classic games. They weren't ultra violent. You know, blood spatter was never a part of our thinking. Um, they played like crazy. I mean, that's that's what I that's what I've always liked about the Atari games. You know, even you know a game like Kaboom, man, that that's that still works. And Breakout is you know as uh, jaded as we might be, it still plays. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't take a lot of resources, and it doesn't take a huge hardware investment. Um, you know, I just upgraded my machine, and I, you know, I'm looking where gaming is going. You know, people with 4K monitors and you know, two thousand dollar computer setups just to play the games. It's that that really wasn't our uh, our our idea of of gaming, you know, at least you know, not that amount of obsession. But it's true, you know, every Atari program had to get at least 2,000 on breakout before they could be part of the group. <laughs> I know, seriously, that was, that, that was the deal. Nice. And you know, it took me at least three weeks to do it, but I finally did it. My wife got hooked into Kaboom, and she's not a game person. She still isn't a game person, but she, she really liked Kaboom. Nice. She got some insanely high score. <laughs> 
Cool. And as I said, I'll give another plug for the National Video Game Museum too. I I, I can't say say enough good things about it. You know, it's a, if anybody gets a chance to go see it, they they should go see it. Yeah, I will. Uh, I will check that out. Um, and put a link to that in the show notes. I haven't been there yet, but uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Do that. Yeah. And here in Portland, have you been to, to the Tektronix Museum? No, I haven't. I didn't realize they have one. Yeah, it's only open on weekends, and it's a bunch of uh, old guys who used to work there in Tektronix heyday. It's uh, pretty interesting if you don't oh, yeah, like, I remember like looking Tektronix at equipment. Like oscilloscopes and things like that. It's, they've, they've got stories. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah, I've still got an oscilloscope. In fact, that's what I used to time my 2600 cartridge. Because I didn't have a 1611A, so I used an oscilloscope. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Cool. Well, I think I have what I need. Um, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Bye. Bye. If you enjoyed these interviews and would like to contribute something, I encourage you instead to donate to one of our favorite organizations, the Internet Archive, at archive.org. The Internet Archive is a nonprofit digital library with the stated mission of universal access to all knowledge. They've done incredible things to preserve computer history, including hosting thousands of programs in an in-browser Atari emulator, creating the Wayback Machine, and offering full-page scans of countless Atari computer books and magazines. Make your tax-deductible contribution at archive.org donate.